Alright. We are starting on time. Oh, it's been 15 seconds. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everybody is doing well today. Let me just get things a little bit more squared away. I have had a a day of fast-paced pastoral duties, so that's okay. Keeps me out of trouble. We'll see what kind of trouble I can get into here with the uh, with the gospel here in. Oh, Genesis chapter 34. We'll have some... Well, it'll be entertaining. Hello, Linda. Hello, Judy. Thank you for joining me. I am Pastor Aaron Finker. I am, again, filling in for Pastor Borkhart on his day off, and I am the Dean of Theology for Higher Things. So I am glad you could all join us for our interactive Bible study. So ask your questions, make your comments. We will all get through this together, and I will try and answer your questions if I see them to the best of my ability or there will be other possibly some other pastors in the room as well and they will also be able to help you out as we engage uh, as the spirit engages us with his word uh, in the in the book of Genesis and we have well quite the doozy of a story today um, well yeah we, there's no mincing words about it, so we'll wait here just a few more seconds, and we will get going. So Pastor Borkhart is here, so maybe he can help. If you've got questions, he'll answer them. I can answer them. Maybe Pastor Lestico will be here today. He can also help out. So again, interactive, and we will get going here. Okay. Ah, and there's the text. Okay. Uh, and Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which uh, she bore to Jacob, went out to see, um, well, to look upon the daughters of the land, or the women of the land, the daughters of the land. Um, and, and right here, right here, there's a problem. This in the in this verse, we don't even need to get to verse two that to know that something bad is going to happen. Because uh, if we remember back to when um, Abraham was going to find a wife for Isaac, um, you could not have one of the daughters of the land. That was not allowed. Isaac couldn't even leave the land. And then when you get to Jacob and Esau, Esau's wives were daughters of the land. And that was not good. So already here we know something is not good. So Dinah is, is off doing something um, that she's not supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be separate. They're supposed to be sojourners in the land. Um sort of in the land of Canaan, but not of the land of Canaan, to put it another way. Uh, but Dinah, nonetheless, she goes out to look upon the daughters of the land, or to see among the daughters of the land. Um, so that is the, the way, that's the, the way it's, the way it's kind of being described. There's an extra, um, an extra, what is that? Um, particle, whatever. Anyway, um, and well, Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, uh oh, uh, saw her. He was the, a prince of the land, a ruler of the land, and he took her and uh, he lay with her and he humiliated her. Um, 
So seized her. Uh, it could mean that it it does not. It, that seems like a very um, sort of violent way of doing it. Um, but it it doesn't. I don't think it has to be that way. I think that's trying to add a layer to this um, that isn't quite there. So he he lays with her. Um. Yeah, not not necessarily love here. Um, but what do we see here in verse three? Uh, his uh, soul uh, was drawn, um, cleaved to uh, Dinah, uh, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman, and he spoke. Uh, unto the woman's heart tenderly to her um, so Shechem spoke to his father uh, Hamor and said get me uh, this girl for a wife okay um, so here he lies with her which he should not have done and yet um, he wants to marry her. Um, so it's not all, it's not, it's still horrible. Um, and so Jacob her, uh, heard that he um, defiled Dinah, his daughter, uh, and his sons uh, were with the livestock in the field. So Jacob. Um, was uh, held his peace was quiet um, until they came so he heard about this uh, probably from Dinah I mean who else would he hear it from uh, but all of his sons aren't there so he's kind of keeping it quiet until um, until the, the boys get home because this is going to be a family deal um, Sort of, uh, so he can sort of break the bad news. I, I mean, it's we're not really told. Um, and Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. Um, and the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard. So obviously, news travels fast, even though Jacob tries to keep it quiet. Um, as things always go, when the patriarchs try and keep something evil quiet, um, it always happens to come out now, doesn't it? Um, oh, she's my sister. Twice. Three times. Um, always comes out. Um, and so they come in, and they were indignant, and the men were very angry, uh, because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel uh to lie with the daughter of Jacob for such a thing uh shouldn't be done so here yeah, yeah not good so they've lined with she, he laid with Dinah and um, they're upset about this that this isn't done in Israel amongst the Israelites amongst Israel um we don't do that in our family um this is not how we roll. It might work that way among the Hivites, or the Jebusites, or the Perizzites, or whatever other ites you might run into in the land of Canaan. Uh, that's the way the world works. And as you see, uh, lying with a woman and then marrying her, um, well, that's the way the things worked back then too amongst uh, those outside the faith. Um, not so among the among Israel, uh, with, with at least it's not supposed to be that way, um, and so uh, yeah, that's why they're really upset. Um, but what does Hamor say? So he, he sort of with these nation states. That's sort of what's going on here. We have to sort of picture this as different groups of people all dwelling in the same land, different tribes. And how do they interact? And so amongst the Hivite clan, uh, this group of people, uh, these sorts of things are done. And now they find out, well, we don't do that 
amongst our people. And Hamor's like, hold up. Whoa. And Hamor says to them, um, uh, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. So it's our bad. They're going to get married. Um, and this is the problem, right? So uh, make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us and the land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it and get property in it. And here we have um, preaching of the devil. Not godly preaching. Because the Lord said, don't, don't do this. Right? Abraham goes out of the way to get Isaac a wife. Um, Jacob gets sent off out of the land to find a not Canaanite wife. Um, to not intermarry because of the false gods. Um, and here they're saying, see, we'll give you the land. Well, the reason I say this is devil preaching is because the Lord already told Abraham, and he told Isaac, and he told Jacob, this is your land. It's not the land of the Hivites, or the Perizzites, or the Jebusites, or the Canaanites. It's your land, Abraham. It's your land, Isaac. It's your land, Jacob. And so this idea that the Hivites are going to say, hey, just intermarry with us and you can get land, it's sort of like we already have the land. In fact, we're sojourning here for a time, uh, but it's really ours. It's not yours. Um, so Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes. Whatever you say to me, I will give. Um, ask for me as great a bride price and a, as and gift as you will and I will give whatever you say to me only give me the young woman to be my wife so here it's like no price is too high to pay um, so the uh, yeah so uh, kind of you, you can get this idea that Shechem and his father are like oops I mean, Dinah was hanging out with all the daughters of the Hivites or the Jebusites or whatever, the, the daughters of the land, all the other all the other women. And she's acting like one of them. And so then he goes, oh, she's just like one of us. And that happens. And then it's like, oh, our bad. Uh, no, we'll get married. That's the way we do things. Um, and you can give us whatever. We're sorry we've offended you, but whatever bridal price you give us, we'll give you. Um and beyond the fact that we're you know saying you can have the land that's kind of already yours um so the sons of jacob answered shechem and his father hamor deceitfully because he had defiled uh, their sister dinah they said to them we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised for that would be a disgrace to us only on this condition will we agree with you that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you and we will take your daughters to ourselves and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. Okay, so there's a lot. I mean, they're answering deceitfully. We'll find out the, their plan. Um, but what, huh, this would also be devil preaching. Huh, because what they're saying is true. They can become Israelites. That's literally what they're asking them. You won't be Hivites anymore. You're going to join us. And that's how we'll be one people. That's the only way this is going to work. You can't remain Hivites. you got to be circumcised and become an Israelite. Because we don't marry outsiders. Um, and th that's the only way. That our daughters will marry with you, um, and we will marry your daughters, as if we are one. Um, and we don't want to miss this point, that they're they're basically trying to make them Israelites. That's the bridal price. Um, now, they're answering deceitfully, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but that's basically what they're saying. Because um, nobody else was getting circumcised. It was really only the Israelites. And and so, um, yeah. Um, 
Their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem. And the young men did not delay to do the thing, because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most honored of all his father's house. So here we see the situation begins in a sinful way. Dinah being like one of the one of the ladies of the land. Hamor being a pagan, you know, doing pagan things. Uh, but yet he does delights in her and wants to marry her. He wants to make this right. He is honorable. Uh, in his father's house, and the most honored uh, in his father's house. Um, are they making accommodations for Yahweh? No, they're not. Um, <laughs> we'll see what their plan is. Um, but it is one of the reasons that Jacob gets upset. But we'll we'll, we'll get there. Um, because there's, there's no accommodations for Yahweh. The Lord always welcomes in those who, by faith, trust in him. Um, we see this experience. We see this work itself out in um, Rahab the prostitute is an example. Um, the book uh, and Ruth is another example. Ruth is a Moabite, and Moabites are never allowed in the kingdom. They're never supposed to be allowed because of all their false gods. And then suddenly you run, run into Ruth, who's like, "No, Yahweh's the true God. Your God's my God. I don't none of those other gods." And suddenly she's welcomed into the to the kingdom, and is in the line of the Messiah. Um, the Lord always wants to bring in others. The the issue we're not in the book of Joshua or the book of Judges, is um, but it is hinted at in the patriarchs so that the Lord has has been giving over the the Canaanites to their wicked ways. They want those false gods and not listen to the true preachers who have come into the land. Well, that's on them. Um, So, um, the idea here is um, you've got to be part of the people of Israel. And if we were to go to, to Exodus and Deuteronomy, there are, are steps and, and time where the people can become Israelites. Um, Moabites can't, and that's why I cite Ruth, that she is welcomed into the kingdom. Um, in just the same way that Jesus says, uh, many will come from east and the west and to eat and drink with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out. Because it's not a matter of birth lineage, though it's sort of tied there because of the Christ that needs to be born. But it's all a matter of faith, faith and the promise. Um, and so Hamor and, his, and, and Shechem are along for the ride. At least it seems. Um, so they's like, get circumcised. Like, that is not the thing you want to sign up for. I I don't see why that would, like, ain't worth it. But for Shechem, it seems worth it. Um, and not only that, um, here we go. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city, saying, these men are at peace with us. Let them dwell in the land and trade in it. For behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives and let us give them our daughters. Okay, so only on this condition will the men agree to dwell with us to become one people. When every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock, their property, and all the beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them and they will dwell with us. And so here we see that they don't fully understand the import of being circumcised right so um the sons of jacob do right that's the covenant that's the sign of the covenant that you are one of yahweh's people these guys are like yeah sure whatever whatever um just let us you know we can sort of trick them and, and we'll become the powerful ones even though it seems that um the sons are trying to say, no, we're going to be the, the top ones. And in this way, an example in the history of this would be uh, kind of sometimes in uh, how some of the kings became Christians back in the, you know, the Dark Ages. It's kind of similar things going on back then. Uh, and all went out of the gate of this city, listened to Hamor and his son Shechem. Every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of the city. Okay. 
So they all did it. Okay. Um, on the third day, when they were sore, the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. Well, that escalated quickly. They killed Hamor and his Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. So, it, he was in her house, or she was in his house. So were they, were they married? Wow. It, uh, we're not really told, but she is living in the same house as, um, unless this is metaphorical, like in some sort of way, like, oh, she had been, you know, betrothed into his house. But I think here we're told this to say like, no, she was living in his household already. Um, so the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and they plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field. All their wealth and their little ones and their wives, all that was in the houses, they captured and plundered. So, so much for the Hivites being in charge. The Israelites have taken charge, and this would um, anticipate the Israelites conquering the land. This prefigures that. Um, when the sons of Israel come in after the Exodus, led by Joshua, very similar things happen. Um, not under the uh, guise of using circumcision as a means to slaughter somebody. Circumcision is the means of, of signifying that you are part of the people of Israel. So that's really underhanded. We'll, we, you will, we will make you one of us and then we'll kill you. Um, and they take all the stuff and they go away. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? Um, so this is the accusation, right? So if there's someone you lie with outside of marriage, uh, in in the in their minds well that's that's a prostitute right so if you're gonna lie with a woman you marry her first and you treat her like a wife not like you would a prostitute so that's what they're upset about but here Jacob is upset um you've brought trouble on me because who's gonna try and sign a deal with them now I mean you literally made them get circumcised which is the sign of the covenant and then you slaughter them no males left. Wiped out. Um, and so this isn't just a... We don't want to lose sight of the, the theological nature of what's going on. This isn't just um, them doing something so that they'll kind of be laid up for a few days. Though it does have that added benefit, um, there is a... Th a theological covenantal freight behind circumcision that Simeon and Levi abuse in order to get the upper hand. Um, so the means by which you would enter the kingdom is actually suddenly the means for judgment and condemnation. Um, And that, um, yeah, I don't know how else to kind of talk about that. And this is where they're not trying to make allowances for Yahweh. They're literally just being underhanded. Um, it'd be, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, it, it could be something like you've got to be, you know, baptized and then in some way, like, but, but you've got to include some sort of legal form. Like, so you've got to be baptized and sign, you know, sign something. Right. And, um, 
suddenly in the certificate of baptism you sign over all your property or something and then then they kill you or, or something it, it there's not a one-to-one -one, but i'm just trying to tie it to the preaching and delivery of the lord's gifts because that's what circumcision is in the old testament and they use the lord's gifts in order to deliver worldly judgment worldly justice as opposed to um using this as a means for repentance and the forgiveness of sins so instead of circumcision being about um uh, a sign of the circumcision of the heart that happens by um god's law and the the heart being then made alive through the preaching of the promise um that's not that's not what Simeon and Levi are all about. And it's even worse because it's it's Levi using the Lord's word and gifts to to be underhanded. I mean, Levi is, um, his sons are the priests. And they use the Lord's word and gifts to, to be underhanded to a guy who, yes, he did something uh, not good at all. And... And yet he's, from all that we can tell from Shechem, is that he wants to be honorable. Um, Hamor, on the other hand, he seems to be kind of underhanded. But either way, it doesn't matter. The, the, it still stands using circumcision as a means for gain. Worldly gain. Using the Lord's gifts as a means for worldly gain and judgment. Um, very echoing of some aspects of um, kind of medieval Ro Roman Catholic practices, using the Lord's word and gifts as a mean for gain or a mean for judgment, um, for political power. Uh, happening here with Simeon and Levi. So Jacob's in this hot mess, and what does God say to him? Uh, get up, go to Bethel, and live there. Make there uh, an altar to God uh, who appeared to you when you were fleeing from before Esau, your brother. Um, okay. So... We're going to go worship the true God off by ourselves because, um, you know, I can't live with the other people. Way to go, um, Simeon and Levi. So there were worldly consequences to their actions. Theological consequences, too, later on, but we're not there yet in the story. Uh, so Jacob said to his house and all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. <sighs> so Jacob knows they've got false gods. It's not just that um, Jacob's a piece of work, right? With all his wives. And he's sort of uh, hands off when it comes to what happens to his daughter. And then he yells at his sons. And here it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, by the way, um, yeah, we shouldn't have any false gods anymore. Put the idols away. So... That is something else. So let's go to Arise and go up to Bethel, so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. Um, so they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears. Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. Um, so there we have those gods that, um, was it Rachel, that took with her? So those are finally gone. So you would have found out about that. Awesome. Um, and as they journeyed, a, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So here again, this echoes and anticipates um, the Israelites coming back uh, in the Exodus. Um, 
in, in much the same way that Abraham going down to Egypt anticipates the Israelites going to Egypt, um, Pharaoh being plagued because Abraham's there anticipates the Israelites being plagued there, um, which all anticipates uh, Christ uh, coming and going down to Egypt uh, when he was born. Uh, so also here, um, very similar thing going on here in 35.5. Terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them. Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. Uh, and there they, he built an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. So El Bethel, uh, El, uh, what is that? 37. El Bethel, God of Bethel, God of the house of God, is what he calls it. Um, and Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died and she was buried under the oak below Bethel, so he called its name Alon Bakuth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um. <clears throat> hmm. God appeared to Jacob again, good because he needs it. So we often wonder, like, why does God appear so much? Uh, because look at what they do. Why does God have to appear to Abraham five or six times to tell to repeat the same promise? You're gonna have a son. In you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Because Abraham doesn't believe it. We see that in how he acts. He doesn't believe God will take care of him. He doesn't believe that um, this seed is coming. And uh, he preaches it, but he doesn't believe it. It's sort of um, like the father of the demon-possessed boy in Matthew 17. Well, I believe, help my unbelief. That's Abraham. So God has to always appear to him and tell him again and again and again and again. I am your God. I've made this covenant with you. One-sided salvation covenant. Because if you mess it up, I'm you're going to mess it up, Abraham. And he does the same thing with Isaac. And he's doing the same thing with Jacob. At every turn when Jacob is going through a rough patch or has been underhanded or deceitful, God always has to show up to repeat his promises. Because then, um, yeah, that's that's the way the Lord does things with us too. He always comes to us again and again with his words and his gifts. Uh, because in the midst of our lives, um, we don't love our neighbors as ourselves. We don't fear, love, and trust in God above all things. We've got all sorts of other things going on. But the Lord is true to his promises. He's true to uh, your baptism. He's true to his absolution. He's true to his own body and blood that he gives you to eat and to drink for the forgiveness of your sins. He can't cast you off, nor will he, nor does he want to. He wants to save you. He wants to save Jacob. He wants to save his sons. He wants to save the whole world. And so again and again, no matter what, the Lord will bring his word to bear upon the world, upon his people, uh, his people collectively, uh, sort of like Jacob does in preaching to um his family put away your false gods or in the way that he does it here just to Jacob collectively individually the Lord is about saving that's what he wants to do it's why he's chosen Abraham Isaac and Jacob um, it's why he sends his son and it's why uh, he does it uh, for you too so God appeared to him again when he came to from Padan Aram and blessed him and God said to him, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. So, there again, you have a new name. You're not heel grabber anymore. You're wrestles with God. I gave you a new name. That's who you are. Uh, and God said to him, I am uh, God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you and kings shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham Isaac, I will give to you. 
and I will give the land to your offspring after you. Uh, then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. Um, so Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. He keeps calling every place Bethel. Um, so here we have... Um, Drink offering being poured out. Um, so again, anticipating the worship of Leviticus. The Lord restores um, the worship of the patriarchs to the Israelites after their 400 years in, in Egypt. Okay. A journey from Bethel, when they were still some distance from Ephrath. Rachel went into labor and she had hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for you have had another son. And, uh, and, when her, uh, and her soul was departing, for she was dying. She called his name Beth, uh, Ben-Oni, uh, son of mourning. But his father called him Benjamin, Ben-Yamin son of my right hand, son of my strength. Um, so Rachel died and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar over her tomb. It is the pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. Okay, so we're going to... Uh, Israel journeyed, and pitched, journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Ader. Uh, so here again, this is what I mentioned. I believe I had talked about this before, is that um, Rachel is just buried where they are. Um, so they're journeying to uh, back where Bethel is, uh, the first Bethel, not the other Bethels that are along the way. Not that that's confusing. Um, but on the way to Ephrath, Ephrata, Bethlehem, um, that's where Rachel dies, and that's where Rachel's buried. She's not taken back to the family plot, um, unlike Leah. Leah is is buried in the family plot. Uh, Leah is buried where Abraham uh, and Sarah, Isaac, and Rebekah are all buried, and where Jacob himself would be buried, along with Joseph. Um, so that's Leah's tomb, the family mausoleum. Uh, but not so Rachel. She gets a tower. I mean, he still honors her, um, but uh, honors her as his as his wife. Uh, but he does not take her to the family plot, uh, which should tell us something about how Jacob came to understand the relationship between the wives, and who the wife of promise was. And it wasn't Rachel. As much as Jacob did love Rachel, and more than Leah, as we're told many times. Um, he began. He at some point understands what the Lord, what the Lord's word concerning marriage is, and concerning um, how the promise is to work as well. Um, Thirty-five twenty-two. While Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard of it. Of course he did. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. Okay, so... It's just it's just never-ending. It's why I call it the saga. It's like a soap opera. It's a soap opera! Um, and you kind of have to laugh at it, but we really shouldn't, because it's terrible. It's just awful. Um, how the sons are, how Jacob is, how... There's no excuse for it. We see sin ravaging the relationships in Jacob's life and his son's lives. And this is the family of the Savior. This is where Jesus comes from. And these are the people that Jesus doesn't just come from. These are the people that Jesus came for. 
he came for the Jacobs and the Rubens and the Simeons and the Levi's and the Bilhas and the Rachel's and the Leah's. And in the way that, that they treat each other terribly, he's for them. He's from a messed up family, Jesus is. He's for his messed up family too. His blood shed for them. You and me too, in our sins. These are the very sins um, that Jesus saves us from. The things that are embarrassing. This is embarrassing. What kind of, of people group has this as their role models? And I think this is part of, I mean, this would definitely be something that, you know, I don't know, I don't really know many um, sort of Jews who, you know, who are, I don't really know any Jews, but this would sort of be my question is, um, what is this all about then? What kind of people group has, like, why are they your patriarchs? Why would, your patriarch is like your role model. Why would Jacob be a role model? Or why are you going to claim some, these are my ancestors, and we're, we're, we're going to keep telling these stories. What's the whole point? It's sort of empty um, until you get to Jesus, and there it's, it makes all sorts of sense. Then it suddenly becomes very clear when you look at the genealogy of Jesus, and you find out about um, Judah and Tamar, or Rahab, or David and Bathsheba. You find out all about those stories. And then you read this. You know, this is also in the back of your mind when you read the, the genealogy of Jesus. And what does it all come down to? Jesus is born, and he's named Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. He's going to save Reuben from this. He's going to save Jacob from what he's done. That's why Jesus is there. That's why Jesus is born. It's for us too. For the sons of Jacob. And we who are sons of, of Abraham by faith. Jesus comes for us all. In the many and various and, and wicked and sometimes laughable but really not so laughable sins. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away all those sins. His blood sets us free to be people of God and not people like this. The sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's servant, Dan, and Naphtali. The sons of Zilpah, Leah's servant, Gad, and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. Okay. So those are all the sons. Dinah doesn't get mentioned, but, well, we've already heard her story. And Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kiriath Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Hey, dad's still alive. So, so much for him trying to, you know, I don't know when I'm going to die, so I better bless you. And then he lives a, <laughs> and he lives a really long time after that. Our days are in the Lord's hands, not our own. We can never know um, when the Lord will, will gather us to his people. Um, and Isaac breathed his last, and he died and was gathered to his people, old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. And that is the end of chapter 35. So I won't continue into 36, but Pastor Borkhardt will pick up there tomorrow. Um, so thank you uh, for joining me on this this fine day. I hope it was a blessing to you, um, and I hope that you have a good rest of your day.